Hi everyone, so uh, we're about to show you the replay of the Crowdcast that we did with my good friend Matthew Moss, Record Director and Curator of the Morrison Natural History Museum. But first, I wanted to have him tell you a little bit about a little fundraiser that he's doing for this awesome little museum. Thank you, Jackson. I appreciate that. So right now here in Morrison, we are hosting an, our annual fundraiser this year for the first time. We're doing it online because we couldn't have a benefit breakfast as we normally would. Um, our goal is to raise, is to match, I should say, a $5,000 donation put up by one of our board members. And we're getting close to that goal, but we're not there yet. The proceeds that we get, all the money that we get from this foundation is going to be reinvested back into the museum itself. I know you guys like the Utah Raptor here. How did we get the Utah Raptor? Folks like you donated in $5 increments, $25 increments, and it all adds up and the, our foundation was able to purchase this Utah Raptor. We've got our eye on some other cool fossil specimens that we want to acquire to show you, to give you a better idea of what once lived here in Colorado at various points in Earth history. So you can find links to donate to us if you're able. Uh, we would sure appreciate it, both on our Instagram page, we're at Morris Museum, and on Facebook too. There's a link right there, multiple posts, you can't miss it. Are you going to do something special on Instagram for people who donate? I will now. <laughs> okay. We just need to decide what that's going to be, Jackson. Something horribly humiliating. Yeah, it'll be an autographed picture of Dr. Jackson Crawford. Uh, okay. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, we'll work it out. We'll um, figure out something embarrassing. That's so, a good doctor. So here's the Crowdcast. Uh, we had some technical difficulties with Wi-Fi and such, so bear with me. I tried to edit through it, uh, but you're going to see some spots where the audio and video are going to uh, be a little bit patchier. All right. Thanks, Patreon, and all the best. Thank you. My name is Matthew Mossbrucker, as you probably know from the bylines here. I direct and curate the Morrison Natural History Museum in Morrison, Colorado. Uh, my job here is to take care of the dinosaurs and show them off to any curious brain that comes through our doors along with uh, the best crew in museums to help out in that mission. Uh, we try to dig here locally, uh, exploiting the local Jurassic rocks where the first Stegosaurus and Apatosaurus were found back in 1877. And I'm also a curator at the Glenrock Paleon Museum up in Glenrock, Wyoming, where we dig in the latest Cretaceous rocks, so T-Rex and Triceratops habitat. So if you guys have any questions about Jurassic dinosaurs, the famous Stegosaurus or Apatosaurus or T-Rex or Triceratops from 80 million years later at the end of the Cretaceous, I'm your man. And I'm sorry about that. So let's go ahead and kick it off with some Q&A. Hit me with your burning dinosaur questions. And I can prescribe some intellectual antibiotics. All right, Vicky is asking, what is your most exciting excavation adventure? Okay. That's interesting. Uh, anytime we find something in the field, it doesn't matter if it's a common fossil or something rare, it's something no human eyes have ever seen before. So that first moment of, of holding something new to you intellectually in your hand is, is always a, a sublime moment, I think. Uh, whether it's a type of fossil that you've seen hundreds of examples of or something that you don't know what it is because it may not yet be known. Um, so that's awfully interesting and that happens every time I go out and, and dig. I've had a lot of interesting experiences with um, boulders nearly falling on my head um, Indiana Jones style. Uh, it is not as fun as you might think it would be in the movies. I've had interesting interactions with um, substance abusing landowners and uh, threats of, of violence, not towards me but for former President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Um, I'm not that old. He was long dead by the time that happened. But uh, yeah, um, every time we go out in the field, we find something new and interesting and, and it makes it worthwhile every time. So David G is asking, what is behind you? Well, beside uh, the good Dr. Crawford, I have a dinosaur known as Utah Raptor. And Utah Raptor is the heaviest raptor dinosaur living here in Western North America around 125 million years ago. It is found in the great state 
state of Utah, although we have rocks here in Morrison at about the same age of deposition. So it's an animal that could potentially be found here in the front range of Colorado. I just haven't found it yet. Um, biggest question is what is it doing? Why is it biting itself? Now, because we have great fossil evidence from other related raptor type dinosaurs that these beasts indeed had feathers, both for display on the arms, legs, and maybe tail, uh, but also for thermoregulation to insulate their bodies from fluctuating temperatures outside. Um, animals today, birds that have feathers, they do require a bit of maintenance in the form of preening, both to spread oil onto the the feathers from a gland located near the cloaca, which is, yeah. And, but also just to get parasites off of them, clean them if they're dirty, the feathers get um, disheveled, disorganized, and, and the active preening puts them back into place. So we have a Utah raptor preening a long gone um, display feathers from its foreland. Okay, tell us about dinosaur feathers. How many had them? That's coming from Cameron. That's a great question, Cameron. The best confirmed feathers that we have from dinosaurs are from relatives of animals like Utah raptor. Um, and as a group, we call these animals theropods. These are primarily carnivorous dinosaurs, although there are examples of herbivorous dinosaurs, like the Therizinosaurus, specifically Bapausaurus, that had feathers, shag-like feathers on its body. Um, there are little beasts that had feathers, like Sinoceropteryx um, from China, and then there are um, pretty big, almost Allosaurus, um, darn near 30 foot long carnivorous dinosaurs that had shag-like feathers on their body, um, too, that's, um, oh my gosh, I'm drawing a blank on the animal's name. Oh well, it existed. It's Aptian in age, mid-Cretaceous, if I talk more about it, I'll probably remember its name, Eutyrannus. Um, there is some evidence that cousins of dinosaurs like Triceratops had a prototype feather on its body. Um, animals like Cytacosaurus, which looks like the three-horned dinosaur Triceratops, but is much, 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 much smaller, hornless and frillless. It is the ancestor of dinosaurs like Triceratops. And it did have bristle-like protofeathers um, ascending from its rump. When it comes to any sort of integument, um, so any covering, whether it be scale or feather on dinosaurs, uh, or even any fleshy structures like a comb or a waddle or a dewlap, there are still fossils that are coming out of the ground that are going to help us to more accurately see a dinosaur's uh, flash, its flare, um, that we don't know about quite yet. Lots and lots of examples of soft tissue and surprising structures. Uh, for example, on the uh, duckbill dinosaur Edmontosaurus, this is a, a school bus sized herbivorous dinosaur from the time of T. rex and Triceratops. Edmontosaurus nectens, one specific specimen, has a wonderful fleshy bump, almost like a cone, on the top of its head. Now, no, whether that is specific to males or females, we don't know because our sample size is one. Um, or if other species that are similar to Edmontosaurus, like an Titan, had a structure like that too, we don't know. Um, but one thing's for sure, um, careful fossil preparation, um, which is getting better and better with time and practice and the use of microscopy, we will begin to find more and more surprising soft tissue structures on dinosaurs into the future. So stay tuned. It seems like Jackson and I have a natural chemistry. Um, how did that start? I think you That's need a pretty good question. It is, it is. And I, I'm going to allow you to answer that. What? So <laughs> let's, let's let's switch. Why don't you talk about the first time you came and visited us at the museum? Well, the first time I visited this museum was a long time before you worked here. Right, I mean, this place has been here, what, since 1995? 1989 is when it was originally open, uh, but it was open by appointment only. We didn't keep regular open hours until the museum became a department of the town of Morrison, and that was in 95. Okay, hey, so I called that pretty right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I was a huge dinosaur kid, so I was in here as soon as it opened, pretty much. And uh, I was real close to uh, where I was growing up. 
uh, more around Evergreen, which is just about the next town over, unless you count like Idledale. No one counts Idledale. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was in here quite a bit. And of course, that was um, when this museum was really different. Oh, yeah. I mean, you have really changed this place a lot. Um, you know, it was a little bit, it was fine. Um, the gift shop was certainly. We had, <laughs> we, we had a cat, and if you remember that the bookshelves that had sweatshirts and a couple of fossil casts in it? Yeah. Yeah, it was a locked cabinet. That was our gift shop when we first started. There were also little bottles that were called fossil water. Oh, yeah. Um, which, you know, I always had an issue with that because isn't all water hypothetically as old as all other water? It is. I mean, we, we as far as water is concerned, we're in more or less a closed system. You would think. Yeah. Um, anyway, so we, even though we grew up, we're close to the same age, growing up pretty close to each other, both being real into, to dinosaurs, we didn't actually meet each other until we were adults. When I came through here in, uh, actually it was in 2011 when I was moving uh, to LA to take the job at UCLA and, and I stayed here for a month to hang out with my grandma and old friends and just came in here out of nostalgia and we, I don't know, we hit it all. Yeah. Were there any true vegetarian dinosaurs? Absolutely. Um, and when you look at dinosaur diet, you don't start with the teeth. I know that sounds kind of intuitive, particularly if you're used to looking at modern mammals. But mammals have a different style of interlocking tooth relative to what dinosaurs had in their choppers. Even though the Utah raptor behind me clearly has some spiky teeth, suggesting it might eat meat, um, as it turns out, Triceratops, which we have one across the room staring at me, it's eyeballing me, that dinosaur's teeth, when they are worn down, um, are just as sharp as a Utah Raptor tooth individually. Um, Triceratops, for example, this is true of all dinosaurs, have a never-ending supply of teeth in their mouths. So every time Triceratops bites down, its teeth grind against one another, and there's a thicker patch of enamel, a harder covering of tooth on one side, very thin on the other. So as they occlude, as they grind against each other, they are sharpening. And not just on a one-on-one -on -one scale, they're part of a, a, a lattice of teeth that are studded throughout the jaws. So as they grind together, they're forming a continuous cutting ridge in the jaws. Um, if you put your finger into the chewing mouth of a triceratops, it would come off. It would, it would come off rapidly. So Triceratops has fairly sharp teeth. Even the Panosaurus, whose head is only about this big for an 80,000 pound dinosaur, its unerupted pencil-like teeth are fairly pointy. Um, and when they wear down, they do have a bit of a sharp tip on the leading edge. So the idea of flat teeth being an indicator of being a, a plant eater, as you would see with mammals or us, doesn't work with dinosaurs. Um, so what does, how can you tell that a dinosaur was a true vegetarian? So instead of looking at the teeth, which can be a bit misleading, we look at these bones right here, these slat like bones, the ribs of the chest. These dorsal ribs will give you an idea of what an animal ate because if you look at the chest of say a raptor or a T-Rex, the chest is fairly narrow and that's because it doesn't take a lot of internal guts, that machinery to break down food in order to extract all the nutrients out of meat. So they have a narrow chest. Carnivores today, dogs or cats, built the same way. When you look at a dinosaur like Triceratops, the chest is as wide, side to side, as it is deep, head to tail. It's a huge fermenting vat. When you look at the chest of an Apatosaurus, it's the same thing. They have these big mobile fermenting vats of, of guts that are capable of breaking down the tough cellulose in plants. It takes a lot more energy, specialized bacteria, flora, and more linear feet of intestine in order to break down plants, extract all of the nutrients out of them. So if you really want to understand what a dinosaur ate, you want to look at the rib cage itself. So when I look at a triceratops, I see a pure plant eater. Um, but when I look at an animal like a Utah raptor behind me, it's carnivore. Great question. Okay, Matt, still says you might have missed one. Uh, okay. Ms. Kepler asked about uh, what dinosaurs in the region have feathers. Oh, what dinosaurs in here in Colorado have feathers? Uh, yeah, I guess it's, it's the version of the question says the region. 
region. So okay. Well, as it turns out, in our area, we do have tracks of raptors from our local early uh, early late Cretaceous uh, Dakota sandstone, and that that animal is a raptor. We know that raptors had feathers covering their bodies, both for thermoregulatory purposes, so little filament-like feathers on their bodies, and proper, almost flight-like feathers on their arms and legs, and sometimes tail too. Um, we don't have any bony remains from that particular raptor. So it's a great question as to whether or not, um, how it would, how the plumage would have been arranged on that body. We just have the representation of that feathered dinosaur group here. Um, we have T-Rex in the area. T-Rex is an animal that if you look at modern paleo art, you see an awful lot of feathered reconstructions, big shaggy T-Rexes. Problem is the animal's living in something like, well, the Bayou country of Louisiana today, uh, hot, wet um, conditions. I, and I don't think that you would see a lot of um, insulation on a dinosaur as big as a T-Rex. It has an issue then with thermal inertia, the, the heat from the core of its body dissipating to the surface. The dinosaur is in danger of overheating if it has too much of an insulatory cover on it. So if a dinosaur as an adult T-Rex um, was covered with some sort of feathers, it would be a very thin coating, very sparse, um, maybe only like guard feathers, if it had any sort of a feather at all on its body. The first ostrich dinosaur, Ornithomimus velox, was found about a 10 minute drive from us here in Morrison, not terribly far away. We found its foot, and we know from good complete skeletons uh, discovered in, in Canada that those dinosaurs um, had a lot of plumage on them um, to keep their bodies warm because they're much, much smaller animals and um, and feathers on their arms as well. So there's, uh, there's a trio of examples of dinosaurs that would have had feathers here, and those um, are all theropods, are all carnivorous dinosaurs. We do have, of course, Triceratops and Taurosaurus in our area. Um, there is some suggestion of a quill-like feather on the hide of Triceratops. I don't honestly, from the skin impressions that I've seen from the specimen called Lane, it's possible, but there's no, um, no rachis, no quill-like structure there. You just have a series of hexagonal scales around what really looks like a nipple-like scale. And whether that had a quill-like structure attached to it, I don't see any positive evidence for it. If possible, I would like to hear more about the plants and the landscape at the time. Well, here's the fun thing. Um, when there were dinosaurs here in Colorado, um, Colorado changed a lot. So for example, the reason why our museum is here is because of historic dinosaur discoveries that were made in Morrison back in 1877. And that's when the first stegosaurus, the plated dinosaur with spikes on his tail, and the first apatosaurus, a dinosaur as long as three school buses parked end to end to end, uh, weighs 80,000 pounds. That's like eight female Asian elephants duct taped together, big dinosaur, first giant Jurassic dinosaurs here in Morrison, right? So if you're a stegosaurus and you were up on your back legs, which they could, and you scan the horizon, uh, Colorado was a pretty flat place at that point in time. Skiing was terrible, not just because the Rocky Mountains were still buried underground and Colorado was about at sea level, um, but also because we were tropical. Um, there's no evidence of any freezing. In fact, in the Jurassic, this is true of the entire age of dinosaurs, there's no polar ice caps. So global climate is considerably warmer than it is today. So it's hot, it's fairly flat. And when it comes to plants, Jurassic plants from the American West are fairly elusive. We haven't found any in our field area here, the type section of the Jurassic Morrison Formation, the band of late Jurassic rock named after this little town, which is frustrating, but the fossil soils, the paleosols that we're excavating give us better clues as to what types of plants could have grown here and the density of ground cover. When we look at these soils, what we're missing is a coal-like organic horizon, uh, indicating that there was a lot of vegetation that was then decomposing and that carbon was being left behind. 
we don't see that we don't see that anywhere here so it doesn't look like there's a lot of plant matter the fossil soils themselves tend to be fairly oxidized um, so that the iron that is in the rock itself it was allowed to rust thanks to a fluctuating water table that would come up during a wet season and then recede during a dry season and that was literally allowing the uh, the iron to rust in place staining that uh, that mud that soil um, a maroon color and a red color so that's interesting because those are some clues to how um, climate affected the life and including the plant life here in Morrison. We know from elsewhere in the formation in the American West because the Morrison formation covers eight American states and a wee bit of Canada. Um, and even though the, the formation varies a lot in time and space because we're dealing with at least nine and a half million years worth of deposition, which is an enormous amount of time. Um, the types of plants that we do find, if you're looking for big, cool plants, are acarians, these are conifers. Um, some uh, dig sites up in Wyoming have produced trees that could have been up to 80 feet tall, um, awfully big, and those were up in the Bighorn Basin. And uh, they're related to um, Norfolk Island pine today. So during the holidays, if things were normal and you could safely go to the the hardware store and pick up one of those soft glittery pine tree looking things that people use as a holiday ornament that's jurassic apatosaurus cow um, as it turns out uh, the new growth on those aracarians is pretty darn nutritious if you let it break down and keep rooming for Thank you for being patient. We, we appreciate that. Um, dinosaur fossils in Scandinavia. I'm aware of some Paleozoic fossils, so fossils of, of animals before the age of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs themselves are not present in Scandinavia. Um, and unfortunately, um, or fortunately, uh, there are other, let's see, or Ice Age animals in Scandinavia. Uh, that have been found, uh, your typical northern European beasts like woolly mammoth, woolly rhino, um, those sorts of animals. But when it comes to dinosaurs, unfortunately that part of the fossil record is missing in your neck of the woods. So not to be a, a Debbie Downer, but um, it is what it is. Maybe if we keep digging, we'll locate some uh, mismapped rocks and find some dinosaurs. All right, John's asking, what do you think personally is the best case we have for how dinosaurs went from using feathers uh, for uh, aforementioned reasons to flight, running and jumping, gliding from trees, etc. cetera? Uh, it's interesting because flight is something funny because flight evolved in dinosaurs a couple of times. You have the Scansoropterids, animals like Yi, Y-I, um, which is a raptor-like animal that had a bat-like membrane um, anchored by its third digit, uh, this finger here. And even though it looks maybe like a, a pterosaur a little bit um, in the wing structure, this animal, uh, Geosternbergia behind me, um, it's an independent flight. Um, it's an independent evolution of flight, gliding from tree to tree, uh, most researchers think. Um, flying as we think of it with modern birds, the way that little dinosaurs would have flown by flapping is different than the way in which a lot of uh, dinosaurs would have flown, especially the small bodied ones, because they're missing some key anatomical attributes, including uh, sternum that is deeply keeled. Um, you're all, we're all about to carve Thanksgiving turkeys, um, hopefully by ourselves. So we're not spreading this virus everywhere. And dinosaurs don't have a deeply keeled sternum. In fact, in most dinosaurs, including in raptors, the, uh, the sternum hasn't coalesced into a sealer unit. It's in two individual plates still, which is kind of the ancestral condition for animals like that. And they're also, even though Utah raptor does have the furcula um, 
clavicles that are fused into a wishbone. It's not spring-like, just as you would see with, with a turkey or a chicken. And those two features, the lack of uh, pectoralis muscle attachment for dinosaurs, and the lack of a springy wishbone, actually helps us to separate from what it means to be a dinosaur to what it means to be um, a primitive or an ancestral bird. Um, when you look at certain um, dinosaurs, say like the little raptors, like a velociraptor, which was uh, feathered, we have uh, bumps on the ulni that correspond to uh, the development of long quilled feathers. Um, little animals like that, probably great climbers and jumping from bough to bough in a tree. Um, it's possible that uh, the display feathers that they had on their arms and legs and tail helped them to maneuver from one branch to another um, more adeptly than just simply allowing gravity to take over. Uh, some of the smallest raptors like Microraptor or Pedopena, for example, both have um, kind of a dinosaur biplane model where they have uh, feathers on flight feathers, asymmetrical feathers on their arms, their legs, and their tail. Um, those crow sized and squirrel sized dinosaurs uh, would have been adept at gliding not just from bow to bow in a tree, but from a tree limb on down to the ground onto the back of a helpless little victim. Um, that would have been quite scary if you're one of our little mammalian ancestors scurrying along the forest floor. So it seems like um, elevation trees might have had something to do with dinosaurs learning how to glide and maybe flapping a bit, um, but they would have become exhausted pretty darn quickly. Animals like Archaeopteryx, primitive bird, would have become exhausted very quickly without its keeled sternum and the rubbery, bouncy, spring-like wishbone. Um, but true birds, animals that did exist during the time of dinosaurs, so like Cretaceous here in North America, we have Ichthyornis, um, which looks a lot like a seabird, and it was a good flyer, but that animal itself was a true bird. Uh, so the ability to have the, the anatomy, that machinery to allow for long sustained flight uh, versus uh, gliding or, or flapping for short distances seems to separate um, proto-bird dinosaurs from true birds itself. Um, but I do think having a bit of elevation helps. I've never really bought into the, the ground up, the running hypothesis. And there's an idea there in which if you're running against, uh, running, uh, trying to catch prey or running away from, from something that you could maybe begin to flap your arms uh, your, which are your wings and gain a little bit of altitude, a little bit of distance between you and uh, something that you are pursuing or uh, being pursued by might be it, but I think by and large, um, gravity helps in this endeavor and trees are uh, uh, proto birds best ally. Let's see, oh, in a second, uh, Dr. Crawford's Raptor Drawing by Dr. Robert Bacher is uh, kind of a channel favorite. So I was curious to know what kind of work he's done at the museum and what it's like working with him. Um, Bob likes to come in and invade our lab, the lab that, uh, that is next to my office uh, so that he can work on his own projects, whether it's for our museum or for other museums. And then his favorite thing to do is really to teach, uh, chatting with volunteers and museum visitors, answering tough paleontological questions, and, and just being incredibly generous with his time. Working with him is like playing catch with Babe Ruth. It, it's a sublime experience. I've known Bob since I was a kid, um, and he is part of the reason why I'm sitting in this chair here today, opening some doors for me. Um, it, he's, he's a great guy. I'm, I, I have uh, nothing but respect and admiration for the man. He is, is everything that you would hope someone of his stature in academia would be, someone that's kind and generous and and, and fiercely intelligent, loves to argue. And um, he's funny. And he's funny. We, we fit in well with that. <laughs> We'd like to think, yeah. yeah. Okay, oh, this is a good one. Uh, what does the timeline look like 
from fossil discovery to the assembled full skeleton in the museum. Usually, there isn't one, because typically when we find fossils, they're not a part of a skeleton. Finding a skeleton of something like a Utah raptor um, is an unusual event. In fact, the animal behind me is a composite based upon multiple individuals from two different quarries in Utah. So in and of itself, it's, it's um, a, a Utah raptor chimera. Um, that's science's best representation of what this species of dinosaur looked like until we find a, a better specimen. Well, there are parts in this, um, this mount that incorporate the holotype, the defining Utah raptor, the first one ever found, parts of the muzzle and the claw, for example. And then a lot of the other elements of the skeleton were from a completely separate quarry. Um, there is a project where in a large sandstone block, a big boulder is being prepared that is chock full of Utah Raptor bits and pieces from both adults and juveniles. So that block, which is, is being prepared by uh, James Madsen uh, right now is um, going to perhaps change the way in which we would mount a Utah Raptor like the one behind me, but Gosh, if you have an ideal circumstance where you have a, say, a medium-sized dinosaur, like um, a Utah raptor, if it's in a mudstone, the fossil preparation would go more quickly, potentially, than it would if it were in a sandstone, which is more slow. But when you have a mud rock specimen, the plasticity of the mud allows for greater crushing and distortion, which uh, when you're mounting a skeleton through the molding and casting process, you do try to correct for that can be done also in the computer these days too after a specimen is scanned um, and then 3d printed um, regardless you have to try to account for that that crushing and that distortion um, if you're 125 million years old and you look this good you're lucky um, that process can take months and, and years um, when it comes to say like the first stegosaurus ever found it is in a sandstone that is so hard because the individual grains of sandstone are irregularly shaped and interlock with one another like, like a three-dimensional like three dimensional Velcro. Um, it's almost like granite, it is so hard. Uh, those bones were discovered initially in March of 1877. Uh, most of them are still in the basement of the Yale Peabody Museum. We have some here at the Morris Museum that we're cleaning. We're still cleaning them because the rock around the bone is so hard, the bone is so Riddle that we have to move very slowly as to not shake apart and break the bone before we break the rock. Um, so it can take years, sometimes decades, to go from the field to the lab. Um, there's an adage in, in paleontology that for, for every, every hour of collecting you do in the field, you have four hours in the lab. Um, in my experience, and maybe it's because we're using microscopes to clean our fossils and some delicate techniques so that we don't injure the fossils. And we're also probing, looking for micro fossil material to help to round out the ecology of the, whatever animal we're working on. Um, we're looking more like 10 hours, 20 hours on average for every hour that we've spent out in, in the field. Um, sometimes more, especially in the case of Stegosaurus, you're on a, um, um, a decade to uh, basis. They, they only collected at Quarry 5 here in Morrison for a couple of weeks and it's been 142 years and we're still, the majority of that dinosaur is still in hard sandstone. Granted, it's not a full skeleton, but we do have most of the tail of the animal. Great question. Okay, so does the private market snatch up a lot of important specimens or is it regulated somehow? It's tough um, because we live as I'm sure some of you might have noticed in a fairly polarized society these days. And there are folks that are very vocal uh, in the private collecting community, the professional collectors um, that sell to museums and to individual collectors, fossils that are found on private land. And then there are academics that are awfully loud about the fact that no one should own a fossil. They should all belong to uh, public institutions and um, only those institutions should be allowed to even collect um, those types of fossils. And in what's being missed is the history 
of paleontology in the sense that in the late 1800s and in the early 20th century, um, it, there was a, a partnership in paleontology between professional collectors that were working for academics. That's what happened here in Norris, really. Um, they did a good job um, at collecting fossils and were working, um, being paid um, salaried by museums to collect for them. Um, and that's really how a lot of museums got the fossil collections that they have east of the Mississippi, not here in the American West. That's where everything was found that was being shipped um, somewhere else, unfortunately. Um, there are professional collectors that I know that are excellent. They take good notes at their field sites. They want to communicate with scientists and show off what they found. They're quite knowledgeable themselves. Some of the best field folks I know um, have been commercial folks. Um, I, I don't want to see them demonized, but at the same time, there are academics that do want to restrict um, that activity and want to make it so that even certain little municipal museums like this one have a hard time getting their hands on original fossil material uh, by raising the criteria of accreditation up so high that um, a cash-strapped organization like this couldn't meet. Um, it's happened here recently in Colorado with the refinement of, of some of our, our preservation laws. So in the end, what we all need to recognize, whether you're a professional collector um, or an academic, is that meet, we need to find a way to meet in the middle here and try to rescue as many fossils out of the ground as we can, uh, fossils that are rare um, or of some scientific significance should be put into an institution, no doubt. Um, but at, at the same time, there are a lot of abundant invertebrate fossils, shark's teeth as vertebrate fossils, that museums, everybody has as much shelf space as, uh, with those types of fossils on them as they can handle. And having them in the possession of a private owner does no one any harm, in fact, could encourage people to respect the history of life on this planet even more. So hopefully um, there will be better days coming where folks on both sides of this divide can work more synergistically one with the other. Hey, uh, uh, Matt. Yeah. Uh, still since you missed one. Um, okay. Sam P. asked, what do you study to be a paleontologist? Oh, gee, people come to paleontology through multiple routes. Um, some historically through geology, um, some through biology, so that's becoming more and more common. And I used to think it was a really good thing, but it removes the context of, of, of earth history and putting animals in ecological groups. So really, I think a foundation in geology uh, with a heavy, heavy, heavy dose of biology, uh, especially ecology, are really important. Statistics are invaluable. Um, if you're dealing with particularly with uh, marine invertebrates, really useful mapping evolution with squids, for example, um, belemnites and baculites. Uh, but when it comes to dinosaurs, like Stegosaurus or us our animal here from Morrison, Colorado, we have a sample size of you now two animals, which is statistically insignificant. So math doesn't apply. So our sample size is too small if you're trying to quantify something like individual variation or sexual dimorphism or anything like that. Um, some people come through, uh, just come to paleontology through uh, museum studies programs. Um, getting into collections management um, and uh, museum education in particular, which is, dude, that is the most fun job you'll have as a museum educator. You just got to find a museum that treats their educators well. Um, and uh, I'll be myself excluded, of course. I mean, we, we, we love our, our educators. Um, and there are some people that come to paleontology <laughs> that have no background in science. Like there's a the most brilliant fossil preparator that I know is, his name is Mike Eklund. And he was a trained accountant that decided to build houses for a living um, because who wants to be an accountant? I mean, come on. And he took up fossil preparation and now he goes around building paleo labs with retired surgical and veterinary equipment, um, microscopes and lights. And he's constantly refining 
fossil preparation, making it uh, standard, just trying to standardize it, make it more uh, more open and more honest when it comes to the amount of reconstruction that's that's done in a fossil. Um, the really good guy, and he's challenged every museum lab in this country to do a better job. Um, there are guys like, um, oh geez, who's at Harvard? Um, worked with Romer. I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Mammal guy. The Tully monster. The joke, the, the prank. Brian Patterson. Sorry. I thought you'd know. Oh, well, I was trying to think. It's okay. He passed away before I was, that was around. So it's not like you, you had the chance to meet him or I. He was a, a guy that started off, Brian Patterson started off at the Field Museum sweeping the floor of the Paleo Lab, fell in love with mammals in particular, um, stayed late, um, taught himself anatomy, became so invaluable to the lab that he was hired by the museum as, as a curator. And then with that group was stolen away by Harvard where he became a professor. Um, and that's where he end, ended his career. Um, so he, he, Brian Patterson, started with basically a low-level entry job um, and his own curiosity to build himself a career in paleontology. If paleontology is right for you, um, the only way to tell, in my opinion, is to start off at your local museum as a volunteer and to see if this, this lifestyle is something that you truly want and truly enjoy um, because it isn't for everyone. Um, there are not many jobs in paleontology. Um, and uh, to open all of the doors possible, uh, I would recommend obtaining an advanced degree um, all the way through PhD and doing a good postdoc these days somewhere. It doesn't hurt either, but it also does not guarantee you a job. So um, it's, it's a gamble. Um, but start off working with the museum as a volunteer to be honest, I work with a lot of retirees that help me out either in the field or in the lab, and they are experiencing the life of a paleontologist and making a contribution to the field, but they have not had to deal with the politics or the stress of, of, of professional paleontology. And I, I sometimes wonder if they've done it the right way. Any other questions I've missed? Uh, yes, yeah, so it says uh, Cameron P asked, do we have any idea of the sounds particularly dinosaurs might have made? That's a good question. Dinosaurs, um, certain dinosaurs, say like duck-billed dinosaurs, have a tubular um, structure on the back of their heads that's hollow connected to both the throat and to the nasal cavities. And models both in the computer and physical models have been built to simulate the sounds um, of those animals. And it's, it's a deep hooting, and forgive me, sounds like a kind of a farting sound. Um, but those are the best practical models. There are some structures like in the nose of a triceratops, a big vacuity, um, which would make a good echo chamber if sound were to be made. Um, there was a big to-do a couple of years ago about dinosaurs not being able to make sounds, um, but we know from the descendants of dinosaur ancestors, modern day crocodilians, uh, that they're capable of making infrasound and birds of course don't have a larynx, they have a biological equivalent called a syrinx, um, which functions in the same fashion. Uh, dinosaurs should have been able to make some sort of sound. Um, plant eaters are probably making more advanced sounds based upon some of their, the structures in their heads than meat eaters would. Uh, mediators might have been making more simple structures, uh, more, sorry, more simple sounds, uh, roars, bellows, infrasound, um, whereas plant eaters were making hoots and honks and, and more complicated um, sounds, probably because many of them were, were social living in large groups, but certainly not all of them. Um, so yeah, um, I wish I had a better answer for that, but that's definitely a, a frontier of science. I mean, there's only been like one paper ever written about dinosaur tongues. Um, so there's still a lot left to be learned. And a lot of colleagues, my colleagues these days, um, want to go to places that um, are not within their national boundaries to dig up fossils and bring them home to their home countries. Still, 
And uh, they're always looking for the next newsworthy dinosaur, the next big discovery, um, kind of chasing that old dragon. Uh, I hope that we're almost out of that phase of paleontology in which we can begin to focus more on the material that's already been collected and some of it's not even been prepared and start to, to slow down our, our pace of publication so that we can create more in-depth, more thoughtful studies of these animals in order to really sharpen the picture um, and turn up the resolution on the picture of dinosaurs because there's a lot of data out there already and locked in museum drawers. Thank you folks. Stay healthy. Don't get the bug. So I thought I would uh, wrap it up, wrap things up. Yeah. So I was such a huge dinosaur kid. I'm just going to mention this little story. Okay. Um, that uh, when I was 10 or 11, I actually found uh, Dr. Robert Bacher's phone number just like in the phone book. Right. He was living mm -hmm. in Boulder at the time. And I used to just call him and ask him my dinosaur questions. I mean, I was that annoying kid. And finally he said, well, why don't we meet up and go to this great Mexican restaurant and get some lunch one day? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I said, yeah, let's do it. And then I went and I told my mom and she freaked out that I was going to meet this strange man. Right. And so she didn't even let me uh, ever call him again. And so fast forward <laughs> to me starting to come to this museum, you know, 10 years ago. And uh, I met Dr. Parker and I told him, you know, I was, I was that awful kid. And um, so the first time that I met him um, here in 2011, I did manage to buy him like a burger or something to make it's up for it. It's a good thing you did because he, he talked about that for years and years about how his kids stood him up <laughs> at the Mexican restaurant. And all he wanted to do was, no, he never mentioned that. I felt really bad about it. I know that's why I'm saying that. Yeah. I, I, I built you up and now I'm bringing you back down again. Thank you. Only for me to build you back up yet again later. You're, a, you're an emotional tyrant. I'm not a good person. Well, folks, thank you for coming uh, to this crowdcast. Sorry for all the technical trouble that we had. Um, it was you know, beyond our control, and we're very old men. So um, we will get this up uh, probably before too long. And um, thanks again, as always. Thanks for your Patreon support. And from beautiful Colorado, we're uh, both wishing you all the best.